Hello and welcome to the State of Nevada training for certification of community-based living arrangement providers. This module will cover disaster and emergency preparedness and how CBLA providers must be ready to handle these situations if and when they arise. The Division of Public and Behavioral Health is the Nevada State Agency responsible for certifying community-based living arrangement provider services. And it's the division's policy to assure quality supports and the protections of health, safety, and welfare for all clients receiving services. With this policy in mind, the purpose of disaster preparedness by CBLA providers who provide housing to clients with mental illness is to ensure proper response by those clients in the event of a fire or other emergency. So while you take care of these clients day to day, you have to make plans for situations that don't happen every day. An emergency can really be a lot of things, and they can be naturally occurring events like an earthquake, or they can be man-made. A fire or smoke, or even a flood could be natural or man-made. And then there are purely man-made incidents, such as bioterrorism or bomb threats, car accidents, or hazardous chemical spills. Whatever happens, it's your responsibility to plan for serious events that threaten your client's safety. Disasters also can be natural or man-made, but they go a step beyond emergencies in that they significantly disrupt the environment of care. This includes damage to buildings or grounds due to things such as severe windstorms or thunderstorms, tornadoes, earthquakes, or explosions. A disaster also can and likely will include the loss of utilities such as water, power, telephone, and other necessities that make for a safe and habitable living environment. Disasters, again, can include floods, civil disturbances, large accidents, or emergencies within the facility or the surrounding community. Let's discuss a few terms that you'll hear used in the event of a flood. Flood watch means that flooding is possible. Flood warning means flooding is already occurring or is expected to occur very, very soon. And flash floods occur when water comes quickly and backs up, which is particularly likely in dry climates such as Nevada's. The response to a flood involves several elements. When a flood strikes, you'll need to have a disaster supply kit. There might be some variations on what exactly you'll keep in your kit or what different agencies recommend be in your kit, but in general, it needs to contain a 72 hour supply of drinkable water and non-perishable food, a first aid kit, and a battery powered radio and flashlight, and of course, batteries. Some people buy a pre-made disaster kit and some people put together their own. Either way, be sure to have one. You'll also need to prepare to evacuate your clients from your CBLA home, which means being prepared to move clothing or other personal items, manually turn off utilities in the home, such as gas and electricity, and listen to the radio for updated information on your situation. And on the individual level, flood response includes flood insurance, which some of you will be required to have depending on your location, or which you might choose to add to your property insurance policy, just in case. Though not as common as in California directly to the west, earthquakes still happen in Nevada. But before one strikes, consider removing hazards such as glass picture frames hanging above beds or securing bookshelves to the wall. As with floods or any other disaster, make sure your disaster kit is ready to go. After a quake occurs, check your gas lines and other damage to utilities, put out any small fires that might break out as a result of the quake, and expect that there will be aftershocks. In the event of a fire, if you safely have time, try to contain the fire by closing the interior doors. But if there isn't time, rescue your residents and yourself by getting out of the immediate area of the fire. Once you do, alert the fire department by calling 911. Evacuate the house as needed, and if you can, go turn off the gas to try and avoid making a bad situation even worse. Another disaster type for which you should be prepared is bioterrorism. This includes the threat of using bacteria, viruses, or toxins to attack people either across a wide area or even within a single location. Something might happen that makes you suspect an act of bioterrorism, 
but leave the official diagnosis to professionals, such as law enforcement investigators or health officials. That being said, if you see or detect any suspicious patterns of illness, report them to the health department that oversees your county or rural area. The response to a bioterrorism incident will have some similarities to other disasters, but also some important differences. While you still want to evacuate the immediate area, people should not be allowed to leave the general area so responders can check everyone out for their own health and to prevent spreading the virus, bacteria, or toxin. By the same logic, people should not be allowed to enter the affected area. Anyone who believes they've been exposed to the bioterrorism agent should wash their hands with soap and water, bag up their personal items, specifically the clothes they were wearing at the time, and then put on clean clothes. Again, to prevent the spread of the agent, shut off ventilation in your home and call 911. And as such an act will lead to an investigation, it should be shut down like any other crime scene. Your CVLA facility, or even the larger area, could be subjected to a bomb threat, which could take many forms. There are conventional, radiological, and radio bombs. Thermobaric bombs use the oxygen in the immediate area to generate high temperature explosions. Bombs can release gas to asphyxiate, suffocate, uh, to asphyxiate or suffocate the target's victims. Bombs can be made to use the dangerous properties of chemicals found in the home or at work. As discussed under bioterrorism, a bomb can be a way of delivering dangerous microorganisms. It almost goes without saying, but if you're experiencing a bomb threat, evacuate the bomb area. You might not know the entire bomb area, so at least get as far away as you think is safe. In the event of exposure to radiation, you need to take into account the amount of time of your exposure, whether or not you had any protective shielding, and how far you were from the source of the radiation. And, of course, call 911. A chemical threat, whether released by an intentional act or if it's an accident, can cause sudden and severe harm if exposed to breathing in, swallowing, or even just touching. What's worse, you might not even notice the chemical has been released before being exposed to it. If there's a chemical spill outside your CBLA home, you may be asked to shelter in place. This involves breathing through a damp cloth, closing all your windows, turning off fans and ventilation, blocking your home's air vents, and then listening to the radio for updates. If you're exposed to the chemical, you need to decontaminate right away, and this means removing and bagging all your affected clothing, washing yourself thoroughly with soap and water, and putting on clean clothes. Then treat yourself for any poisoning symptoms you may be experiencing and for any possible burns. And then keep yourself busy with other tasks to help maintain your mental focus in case the chemical starts to get to your head. We've talked about a lot of possible occurrences to be prepared for, but now let's talk about the act of getting prepared. A good place to start is with pen and paper and writing out various responsibilities you have, both in times of calm and once an emergency is actually occurring. Another good step is to write down your list of supplies, both so you can acquire them and so you can periodically check your list to make sure you have everything you need or to refresh your supplies as needed. You can make an action plan that includes actions for any type of incident or for specific types of incidents. Then of course, you'll want to practice and review so that when an emergency occurs, you can draw upon the experience of drilling to help you through a very scary moment. Some tips when writing out your disaster plan are to keep it simple, make it easily accessible to your clients and staff, in fact, keeping it near the phone is a good spot since most likely you'll be using it during a disaster. And remember that your plan response must be appropriate for each kind of disaster. Let's go over in more detail the contents of your disaster kit. We'll start with a first aid kit to handle any immediate injuries sustained in the incident. Next, a good water supply is one gallon per person per day. Your food supply should be non-perishable and should not depend on refrigeration, cooking, or water, 
because your ability to refrigerate or cook might be knocked out and you have to plan for water to be in short supply. Make sure you have the medications that your clients or even yourself needs, particularly life-saving medications such as insulin for a person who's diabetic. Tools can include anything from a hammer and nails to matches and candles, a flashlight, a radio, and of course batteries. Sanitation could be a problem, so keeping some alcohol or bleach or disinfectant could also be important. A supply of emergency clothing and bedding, important documents, and then any specialty items you can think of should also be taken into account when making your disaster kit. You also need to have an evacuation plan in case the emergency situation warrants it. Your plan should include where you and your residents will go, what you'll take with you, and how you'll let family, friends, caseworkers, and others know where you are. Let's go over some specific community-based living arrangement provider responsibilities for disaster preparedness. As part of your orientation procedures, you'll need to provide specific instructions to all new staff and clients regarding fire, emergency, and disaster plan procedures. You need to ensure that residences have a drawn out floor plan that clearly and distinctly identify evacuation routes and that those plans identify a relocation site for clients to reconvene once they're evacuated. You need to ensure that clients have emergency telephone numbers posted and site specific emergency evacuation plans, including the address of an alternate source of shelter. Every month you need to conduct fire drills. Also every month you need to inspect and test smoke detectors and fire alarm systems. And you need to collect and evaluate information regarding injury, injury and incident reports. In the event of any kind of disaster, you will need to follow the appropriate incident reporting procedures for your facility or for your clients. And then you need to identify deficiencies in any of your disaster procedures and take action to correct those deficiencies so that you're better prepared next time around. Your clients also have some responsibilities when it comes to being ready for disasters. They need to maintain an understanding of what to do in case of a fire, emergency, or disaster situation. They need to know the location of smoke detectors, fire alarm poles, portable fire extinguishers, emergency telephone numbers, and the gathering sites for after an evacuation. Finally, they need to participate in emergency and disaster drills so they know what to do when that life or death moment arrives. This is the end of the disaster preparedness module of the training for Nevada Community-Based Living Arrangement Certification. Now you need to go take a short test and when you pass it, you'll be able to print and download a certificate of completion.